This is our second time doing this, but we're, we got to pretend like this is new, Harrison. Okay, okay. So, a Harrison Greenbaum. Baum. Greenbaum. <laughs> I this can't the, say. This is the one where it goes completely off I know, the rails. Gonna, This is going to be the best podcast. <laughs> yeah. Look, comedian, magician, extraordinaire, went to Harvard, helped me out when I first started comedy. The dude destroys on stage. He's in Circus Soleil, Mad Apple. Look, I think this is the even better intro than the first time when we when we supposed to be doing the podcast, what but are you, you met. About? This is the Yo, show. No, no, Alex, let's be honest. You messed up. <laughs> Alex is the engineer. Didn't plug in a cord. And that's why we're doing this again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. And if, and if Michael isn't laughing at a joke, it's not because it's a bad joke. It's it's I've heard, heard it twice. It twice. Twice. <laughs> twice, Alex. I've heard it twice because our engineer didn't <laughs> plug in the plug. Doesn't he look a little bit like if the kid from Up had a had a baby with the kid from Coco? Yes. Right? If you took the two leads of those movies and you jammed them together, right? Coco you get Up. this engineer. And by the way, <laughs> by the way, before we get to Harrison, Alex is on a tremendous weight loss. He's lost 15 pounds. Wow. And how much do you want to lose, Alex? Uh, probably like 120. What, he's going to lose 120, 130 pounds. That's a whole. Because he's not eating, maybe that's why he's forgetting quartz. There we go. Yeah. That's is it. That, is that it? Is that? But we're so encouraging, man. And keep that journey up. We love you, Alex. All right? All right. Harrison. Yeah, we're not going to keep ripping on you because we don't want you to stress eat and then lose all the gains. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Harrison. I love you, first of all. You're I awesome. You too. Uh, you're awesome. Um, I want to. I want to start with Harvard. Sure. Okay. Before we get to all the great things you're at, Harvard. <laughs> this, because you're the only person I've known that's gone oh, to Harvard. Go. Yeah. Now, when you got, how many colleges wanted you out of high school? Were you a smart, I mean, obviously you were a smart student. I was like a goody two shoes valedictorian type for you sure. You were the valedictorian. Yeah. I did like the, like the editor of the newspaper and the yearbook and the, all, you know, captain of the mathletes, which I mean, can you imagine? You were the captain of the I mean, how much ass I got being the captain of the mathletes. I mean, come on, I thought that we was just. We were the only team that didn't have cheerleaders and I was very upset about it. <laughs> I mathlete. Wow. We didn't get one cheerleader. Like if like maybe if they had like when they auditioned for football cheerleaders, like take the ones that got rejected and be like, but you could do the math. Mathletes, right? Because that sounds so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. We had a slightly better record than our football team. <laughs> so so you go through how were you in high school? Were you popular? Were you not popular? I mean, you're a mathlete, but <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, but there might be popular mathletes. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I was like, I was outgoing. I think everybody like, I think people liked me. I would never consider myself a popular kid. Um, I, you know, I was probably the magic kid. I think I did a lot of magic. I went, In high school. Yeah. One time my mom went to pick me up from, from high school and she saw me surrounded by all these people and she thought I was getting beaten up or something because they were yelling. And then when she got close, she realized I was just doing magic tricks. Do you remember what magic trick that was? Uh, I think it was probably a card trick. I think I was one of those kids who had like a deck of cards in his bag. So I was ready at a moment's notice. Uh, always ready. Oh, yes. Always prepared. Yeah. Okay. So in high school, you uh, popular through magic. Drama club. Drama club. That was definitely a defining thing, like a theater kid for sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So wh when did you decide? Was it in high school? You were like, okay, I'm going to go more the comedian magician route or I don't want to be the actor. I had no idea. Although the funny thing is, if you had really like taken a young Harrison and be like, what's your dream? Like, don't don't worry about what your parents think. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. What is your dream? He would have said headlining a show on the Las Vegas Strip, like as a magician. Absolutely, that's what he would have said. So did you go to college more because of your parents or did you want to go to Harvard? I, I did want to go. Like, I, it felt like I didn't have to make a decision what I was going to do with my career. I was like, all right, let's apply to, let's just apply. I applied early to Harvard. So I got in by like December of that year. Uh, and everyone was like, oh, now you can party. And I was like the only idiot who just like, no, 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 I still need to keep the grades up. <laughs> and they're like, you're already in, what are you doing? And I, like, I remember there was one test where uh, my great, like everybody took this economics test. The grades came back and my teacher had to be like, I didn't include your grade in the curve because everyone, like everyone else was getting like 40s because nobody was studying. It was like the end of the yeah. year and I was still studying like an idiot. So you got like a 90. Yeah. 
So he's like, I can't include you in the curves. You were that guy I that would that screw guy. up the curves. Yeah. I was always wondering who those, it's Harrison. Yeah, it was me. I'm oh, sorry. Oh my God. <laughs> but now we're both doing the same job. Now we, we both tell dick jokes for money. And, and, and <laughs> I didn't go to Harvard. So I feel a lot better that we're same level and I didn't go to Harvard. I mean, yeah. I mean, I graduated top of my class at Harvard and now Did you I, really? I mostly make money in basements. Well, now I guess I'm in theaters, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's so. How was Harvard for you? Was that like just because the people that didn't go to Harvard were on the outside? We have this image of is cutthroat, you know, people just just not being nice to each other, being having this attitude of I'm smarter than you. Like that's the image I have. Yeah, of Harvard. I mean, I it, it was really fun. Like I for had you. A, I had a blast. Um, I started the stand-up club on campus, so it's called the Harvard College Stand-Up Comic Society, or Harvard College Sucks is the uh, acronym, uh, which was fun because we we submitted the application. I just wrote Harvard Stand-Up Comic Society, never gave, giving them the acronym, put all the paperwork in. I get an email almost immediately saying, "We need, you need to come to the dean's office. There's a problem with the name. I'm like, ah, oh, shit. So I come in, and they go, we see the name Harvard Stand-Up Comic Society, you're an undergrad organization. You need to be the Harvard College Stand Up Comic Society. And I was like, oh, they don't know. <laughs> I've never changed paperwork faster in my life. I was like, I'll, I'll be right back. I went to my dorm, changed it all. Uh, they didn't realize it was Harvard College sucks, sucks until I applied for like the t-shirt. Because I was like, anytime you print Harvard, you have to like, get their approvals. So we sent them the logo and the shirt just said Harvard College and then sucks on it. And they're like, oh no. <laughs> and I have this email being like, we really, we can't take away your registration, but we like strongly disapprove. And it wasn't until my five year reunion that a dean came up to me and it's like, I couldn't tell you while you were a student, but like that was the best prank that's ever been pulled That's out. great. So obviously yeah. you need to make the shirts. We made a variation of the shirt. Yeah, okay. we weren't allowed to just write Harvard College sucks, but we could put the full name and then have the S U C S be different color. <laughs> so, like from a distance, it definitely from a di just yeah, up. yeah, yeah. Okay, so now top of the class at Harvard. What yeah. did you feel the pressure, or were you just? It was it easier for you because you were just a great student over there. I mean, it's definitely more challenging because all of a sudden you go from everybody there is the top of their class. Yeah. Like one of the things they do is they sit you down like your first week at, at Harvard and they go uh, like basically that they sit you down, they go, look to your left, look to your right. Only one of you can be in the top third of the class. <laughs> like, like the, if you ask, if you ask students who like, do they think they'll be in the top, like let's say third of their class, like two thirds of them think they will be, which is mathematically yeah. impossible. Yeah. So they try to set your expectations there a little bit. Um, but I, I took a psych class my first semester and I loved it. And so I just, I, I enjoyed my work so much that like, it, it would just, that was how I picked my major. I was like, what's going to be how, the most fun. And that's how you got into stand up comedy through Harvard, right? Like that kind of set it all yeah. off. I mean, I, tell I, us how that all went Yeah, since we have to say it again. Yeah. He from forgot, the top, from the top, because uh, Alex Coco. forgot to plug in a plug. <laughs> uh, so there's, uh, I went to magic camp as a kid. Uh -huh. um, so obviously a virgin until college. And uh, <laughs> graduate camp changed my life. I would think women love magic. Like I think I think y'all just say that. But to me, <laughs> I think, I mean, how, when you're that young, how can you impress a girl? I mean, magic will. And it impresses a bunch of people. I think it would, be, I, 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 would I, I would think it's the opposite. I think it can, I think it can enhance what's there. If you're not really good with picking up a lady, have, adding magic is not going to make you better at picking up a lady. Okay. I think it's going to make you much just weirder. <laughs> uh, I think it's I think it's something you can use to be like, hey, this is a cool thing that I have. Um, Got you. But I don't. It does it doesn't replace. It's social, not like social comedy. skills. It's not like comedy. Comedy is just a straight social skill. So if you're good at talking and making people laugh, that I feel like helps you in a. But social that situation. that's on stage. Some I mean, we both know comedians that are not yes. like they are in real life. Hundred like, percent. Like on stage, they're one way. In real life, you're like, yo, who are you? You know. Yeah. And magic, like I always talk. Sometimes it suffers from what I call the jazz flute problem, which is in Anchorman. Will Ferrell is on a date with Christina Applegate. And he's just like, oh, I don't know if I can play jazz flute. And then he pulls the jazz flute out of his sleeve and then he just starts playing it. Like he's obviously been prepared for this yes. the whole time. And so that was the thing that I realized in high school was like, you can't just like be out on a date or out at a movie. And they'd be like, here's this deck of cards I carry in my back pocket. <laughs> Magic time. <laughs> So like definitely that I think yes. is, there's a lot of jazz flutes in the magic community where people are like, oh, you want to see a magic trick? Well, <laughs> let me take out this scarf. And you're like, oh, well, of course. So you've been just sitting there this entire dinner <laughs> ready to do the scarf trick. So that that I think under un, undermines any uh, gains you might get. Do you like hanging out with magicians or comedians more? 
There, it's very different. Yes, hangs. tell me the world. So Why different. is it different? Um, magic has definitely has. It just they're different people. Like uh, I think comedians are people who want to. Uh, comedians speak truth to power, mm-hmm. and magicians are powerless people who want power. In, in, mm. in, to put it in that way, like magic is a sort of when you're on stage as a magician, you're kind of saying, "I have these powers that you don't have." Um, comedians, on the other hand, are like, look at these people who do have power. They're assholes. Yes, it's very true. So they're true. just sort of a different, they're both sort of speaking truth to power in different ways. Um, and that comes through in like the way you hang out with them. But just, m- magic is a lot of like talking shop and like, let me show you this. Oh, I want to show you this. So y'all, y'all don't mind sharing tricks with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's nice. Yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, there are magic conventions. So like you can go to a magic and I, I lecture at magic conventions. So you get up there and like people pay to see other magicians teach them stuff. Oh, okay. Where that's definitely not like comedians then. Yeah. No, and also com- there's like amateur magicians. Like there are, there are people who magic is their hobby and they love magic and they might even be the best at something within like there, there are some really great magicians who are also lawyers. <laughs> like they're lawyers by day, but then like they go to the magic conventions and they're known as like the greatest practitioner of this, or they've written a book on magic. That's considered a classic, you know, do, do you feel that, um, magicians, I guess so they got a they got a very is there a bigger opening for magicians today or when you started because I would imagine with social media everything's getting bigger but at the same time it's getting smaller at the same time like if you were a magician starting today yeah is it tougher to get in the game because I feel no, like it's easier cuz it's the, easier all now. the okay. tools to learn magic are much more accessible Got you. When I wanted to learn magic, I had to go to the magic shop and buy VHS tapes and like rewind them over and over again Mm -hmm. Um, or go through books, which, you know, you would see, I'm a lefty too. So any instructions in a book, I'd have to reverse in my head as I read them. Uh, So I would be sitting with this giant book and it would take you hours to figure out how to take this text and turn it into a magic trick. So it would say, put your right pinky finger here and your left forefinger here. And then, you know, put your wrist over here. Like it's literally that kind of grinder detail, trying to figure things out from photographs. And now you could go on YouTube and be like, how does this work? Yeah. And some of the explanations are bad. So that's the, that's the interesting thing is the people putting out the tapes and the books uh, on a whole, the, the reason they were able to do that is because they've reached some sort of level where people were like, we have this equipment, let's make a magic instructional tape and sell it through stores. Anybody can upload a video to YouTube. So there's sometimes you see kids learning tricks and they're not learning it the right way or they're learning it in the wrong order where they don't know the sort of basic fundamental stuff that, that are foundational, but they can do something really fancy and hard that even some of the best guys can't do. So yeah. it's like that weird thing where at Magic Camp every year we see that, you know, I've been a counselor there for over 15 years. So you see the changes in how kids are learning magic. And they and are they better now or before? They're as talented as they've ever been. Okay. But sometimes like you have to kind of have them go backwards and be like, but let me show you the classic stuff. Like we need to show you some of these basic foundational things. You, you, you've gone so far ahead in some things, but we need to come back for a second and teach you some of those other stuff. Because what I, what I find about, like I only started comedy like 11 years ago now, but I even, I have seen the market shrink because there's more opportunity for kind of comedians to <laughs> take weekends, you know, maybe they have a big TikTok, maybe they have a yeah. big YouTube. Am I, am I, one of my friends really explained it. And this is you where need I, to tell me if somebody gets popular for six second dances, they might not have a full hour to do on the road. I know. Like, is that what you're telling me? So many comedians have opened up for TikTokers and YouTubers that don't have material, right. you know, but they'll sell like four shows. But they out. can dance. But they can oh, dance. Can they dance? <laughs> oh yeah. They just <laughs> shows 12 seconds. They do two dances That's and they're, done it's the same joke but they loop it they loop it over yeah. and over and over so it's a thing where um like if if you have x number of weeks in a year you have uh, like 52 i think 52 yeah you have 10 <laughs> you have 52 weeks in a year but let's say you have 10 to 15 comics that sell out so they get the f- top 15 spots sure and then you have people like my level that can move like 700 to a thousand tickets a weekend so then you well, have but if they plug in all the microphones and record i think that can go up at least 10 percent that's what I think. Do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I think okay, that's just holding okay. you back. But then, but then. <laughs> <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> anyway, anyway, then you have, so you have like 20 something spots for people coming up. Yeah. That, and clubs, like it, it, you have all the comedians in the world going for those 20 spots. And then you have these 
30 something comedians just going to every like eight rooms. So those spots are cut short. So it's hard for new people to break through in yeah. those type of clubs. And, and people used to come up through the feature feature. Absolutely. And that whole sort of middle class kind of evaporated it evaporated. using the local guys. And because they don't want to pay the money because everybody's just coming out of pandemic. So yeah. I guess the question I initially asked was, when you see that going on in the comedy world, are there a lot of, because I'm not in the magic world, are there a lot of opportunities for magicians to yeah. work? I think in comedy, in comedy, you're either sort of uh, not making a lot of money or making a unbelievable amount of money. Yes. There's like, there's definitely like two, they're very far poles. Yes. Um, then there are people, you're either making $10,000 or $10 million. In magic, you can be like upper middle class and nobody knows who you are. Like you just do in bar mitzvahs and weddings and you're making ah, a very okay. solid living. So that's where the money As a magician. From. Gotcha. Uh, corporates, uh, trade shows. There's a lot of money to be made as a non-famous magician. Uh, so there's a lot more of those out there. Um, so it depends what your goals are. I mean, I think if you said name a famous magician, there's maybe five that people can David name. Copperfield, of course. Copperfield's number one. David Blaine is up there. Um, Penn and Teller, I think are probably your favorite there. carrot top. Carrot top. Absolutely. Um, but like Chris Angel. Oh, he's not a comedian. Who? Though. Chris Angel. Uh, never your heard favorite. of him, but, okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> why do people hate Chris Angel? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, or not, not, not hate him, but like dislike him. I don't know. I mean, I, I do remember seeing his show when I was a kid at like WWF, like the wrestling thing. And I remember everybody really like, I remember liking it quite a bit. Um, so the talent was there for sure. Is it because they don't like, it's not about his magic. They don't like the way he handles himself. And I'm not talking about you with Chris. A. I'm just talking about magicians. Cause I've heard this from other magicians as well. Yeah. I mean, I had my own stuff. Um, but right, I mean, in December of, tw of last year, I uploaded a parody of a menu of his restaurant. He opened up a restaurant called Kablip, Chris Angel's Breakfast, Lunch, and Pizza. Oh. Uh, so I uploaded. Never heard of it. Is yeah. This, it's is 65 miles in the middle of the desert. It's in the middle of nowhere. Oh, wow. Uh, and I was doing a magic roast. Um, and I roasted up every, everybody in magic, anybody who did anything notable. And so I thought it would be fun at the end of that roast to be like, hey, uh, kablibrestaurant.com is not, is not the... URL for the Kablip restaurant. And the reason I know that is because I own kablibrestaurant.com and I've uploaded a parody of the menu. Uh, and it says very clearly, like, this is a parody. Like, uh -huh. if you want to go to the real menu, click here. Uh, and also uh, at the bottom of the page, it's like, donate to Chris's, Chris out of a charity in his child's name for uh, children with cancer, which is a great charity. Yes. The Johnny Christopher Charitable Foundation, definitely donate to it. It's great. Um, I, I put links to that on the bottom so that any attention to the menu would raise money for his charity. Um, uh, and all that being said, I got a very aggressive cease and desist uh, oh. several days later. Um, so that is always like a weird thing. So uh, dealing with that was not super fun. I had a very cool lawyer um, from Public Citizen, which is Ralph Nader's uh, uh, nonprofit, write a very strongly worded letter back being like, I'm pretty sure uh, comedy and parody is protected under uh, every law in the United States. So do you still have the website? Hell yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. As somebody who wrote for Man Magazine and is very well versed in parody law, I am absolutely allowed to upload a parody of somebody's menu, especially of a, a restaurant as sillily named as Kablip. <laughs> <laughs> I have never heard of it. I didn't even know he had a restaurant. So there you go. There you go. Yeah. I don't think anybody's heard of it. No one I've ever talked to said they know about that restaurant. Yeah. And it's, have you ever gone just to see it? I don't think I'm allowed in is my guess. I'm sure there's just a photograph of me and then it just says, <laughs> no, no, yeah. stay out. Yeah, exactly. All right. Let's start. Let's jump. I know we're jumping around, but comedy seller. That's, I met you. I think, what, what did, do you remember where we met? I think it was Gotham. I think we met at Gotham. Yeah. 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 I thought you were phenomenal. You were funny. And then we kind of, you did your thing. I know you toured with The Illusionist, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which was awesome for you. Went to Australia with The Illusionist. Went to Kazakhstan, the Broadway of Mongolia. How uh, was that <laughs> whole experience? It was really bizarre. I mean, first of all, doing any kind of stand-up where you're performing in one language and then it has to get translated before the audience can really understand what you're saying is its own little, it's a, is a trip. Um, my translator was great. They were like, we're going to find you somebody who's like 
in the comedy industry in Kazakhstan. And they found a clown, uh, a circus clown, uh, which in a way, a sneak preview of the rest of my life. There you um, go. There you go. He was really great though. His name was Marat. Uh, he was awesome. Uh, I, I sat down with him before our first show and I was like, I'm going to go through all the jokes that I think I'm going to be doing and I'm going to explain to you why they're funny and why they work. Like what about the way I phrase it? What about the rhythm is making it funny? So that he would have sort of an implicit understanding of what needs to be translated. What's the most important thing? Because my biggest fear was that in the translation, he, he would lose, lose the, the reason meat. it's yeah. funny. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to his credit, I mean, we, we worked on a sort of a system where I would give him a certain amount of a joke, then he would translate it, then I'd give him more of the joke, he would translate it. Uh, and so... I, I knew exactly how long it would take before we get to the end of it. And I, and then I would hear, so I'd tell the punchline and then I would like white knuckle it. Like, okay, I got four or five seconds before he translates it. And then you'd hear the laugh and you're like, okay, good. It worked. So, so how long did it take you to get used to that? Cause that's very odd. It was super odd. I would accelerate into the punchline. So okay. we, would do, we would translate less and less and less until we got to the punchline. Gotcha. So that was super useful. Um, but like it was, yeah, it, it was also figuring out what jokes do and don't work. Like anything with wordplay is not going to work because it's yeah. going to get translated into another language. And then cultural things. Like I was performing in front of this giant glass ball, this giant sphere. It was, like very, it was next to the theater. So I was trying to make Epcot jokes. And then I was like, oh, they the vast majority of these people do not, have not been to Disney. So that Epcot joke went, what, the, even the, um, Marat came to me, he's like, what is, what is Epcot? <laughs> and I was like, cool, that joke's out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they, they, I think I was basically the first stand-up comedian that's ever performed in Kazakhstan. Um, they've had some American movies come in. Uh, I did ask them, I said, who's your fa Who's the most popular American comedy actor in Kazakhstan? And they said with a completely straight face, Rob Schneider. Because <laughs> Deuce Bigelow made its way over to Kazakhstan and they love it. Really? <laughs> yeah. So that made it over. Wait, how long ago was this tour? This tour is probably 2016, 2017. It's not th that. Not that long ago. No. <laughs> Rob Schneider. Rob I mean, Schneider. he's look, huge in Kazakhstan. There you go. Who would have known? Here, there you go. Wow. Yeah. They've had movies come out since then, you know, yeah. but if they're stuck on Rob Schneider, I mean, no offense to Rob Schneider. Oh, yeah. He's a great guy, but that's a very odd name to say. I was thinking maybe like Kevin Hart, Chris Tucker. Or, no, it's Rob Schneider, Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo. They love it. The comedian they hate the most is yes. Sasha Baron Cohen, just because Borat is supposedly from Kazakhstan, but he doesn't look or sound like he's from Kazakhstan. So they take personal offense to that. So they oh, like, do gotcha. not make any jokes about that. Don't be like my wife, don't do any of that stuff <laughs> because that's the Kazakhstan people are sort of Asian, sort of half Asian, half Russian. That's sort of like they're in they're near Mongolia and Russia and that, that whole thing. Um, they don't look or sound anything like Borat. Uh, Borat's fake language is like mostly I think Yiddish and Hebrew. Oh, is it? Yeah. So it doesn't sound like Ka the Kazakh language. Um, and they're, they're also not all living these like crazy villains. They, they just take offense because that's the most press I think Kazakhstan's gotten in like American media. Ever. And so that's what people think of when they think of Kazakhstan. So they are like, that's not our country at all. Mm -hmm. So It'd be like if everybody who goes to New Mexico is like, you all do meth like Breaking Bad, right? Or or when you go to, t this is what I hate, and they still this, do this in America. Anytime they talk about Texas or show a promo for it, there's a person on a horse. Like I've never <laughs> ridden a horse once. Like, come on, stop it. Stop it with the horses in Texas right. and the big cowboy hats. You know, yes, there are some people, but not most of them. No. Right. You know, we're normal people too. So uh, you you do this tour. Was there was there anything that stood out to you the most that you love or hated about it? And was it a thing where you're like, this is what I want to do or I want to get back to the root of just stand up comedy? I mean, that's always my sort of uh, lotus stone is is the stand up. So, like, OK, it's always about go like going back to the clubs, working on the material. That's the that's always the process, um, even with uh, Matt Apple, like. They've Cirque has been amazing in giving me the, the freedom to like, they're like, just kill. That's your, that's the rule. Just be funny. Just kill. Um, do it however you need to do it. Um, which is amazing. Like it's unbelievable to have that kind of freedom and trust from a company like, like that. Um, so on the off days, I'm usually trying to go to clubs and we've run into each other a million times where I'm, that's where I'm working on new material, things that I think I might want to work into the show eventually. And that's the, that's the stuff that keeps me creatively alive. It's like workshopping and working on new stuff and then hopefully bringing it into those kind of things. How long do you try out a joke and it doesn't work before you let it go? Usually. It depends on the joke. Yeah. Uh, if it doesn't work, I, I never do a joke that's not working more than a couple of times without changing it at all. Like okay. if yep. it's not working, something is wrong with it. Yes. I'm going to have to tweak it. 
Uh, it's one of those things where you tweak it a few times and if it's still not working, you're like, maybe the premise itself is flawed. Uh-huh. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, I'm not sure you found this, um, where you're working on a bit and you think you know what the funniest part of the bit is. And then it's the throwaway line at the end of it that kills. And you're yeah. like, that's the bit. Yeah. So you throw everything else away and concentrate on that part. It's so interesting how, you know, of course the crowd's going to tell you what's funny, but sometimes you'll just say something that's not even part of it or it's just a thought. Yeah. And that's so funny and it's just so organic that you're not even like performing that part. It just comes out. And I, that's what I love about comedy is like, you just never know. You could do the same set in front of the same people and get a totally different reaction. Yeah. Like, and you never want to leave on a low note. I, the, the story that I love, me and Darnell Rollins, we were at the improv and we both did the early show and destroyed, like destroyed the early show. Then they come up to me and Darnell say, y'all want to do a late show? Now we should have left. We should have <laughs> left. But I remember. But it's like the drug thing. They're it like, is. there's more drugs. Yeah. And we're like, like yeah, is that the same yeah. quality? And they're like, now you're like, it's the drug. It's the drug. So we go <laughs> and we both did okay, but it wasn't like the first show. And we were talking about, man. Our night going home would have been so different just leaving after the first, because it really affects you yeah. as a comedian because oh, you're not good until you go on again and crush it. Right. Then when you crush it, you're like, okay, I'm back. But that's the beauty of like New York is you're doing so many shows that you, you're like, all right, I'm going to work on this new stuff. And if it doesn't go well, I have four more shows yes. uh, to, to figure it out. Um, but it's, it's unless that last show is bad right? because then <laughs> overnight that's the whole thing Darnell was like he said the funniest thing he says I think I have to go to a grocery store get on one of those walkie talkies and make somebody laugh yeah there, just so I can end on a laugh you know and, and <laughs> exactly. that's the, and that's the kind of drug it is it's like you know I see comics come in and out of the cellar and it's like I, I tell them they'll have a bad set one show and I go there's 13 more right you know what I mean it's like there's 13 more and what I've noticed the pattern is if you do 14 shows at the comedy cellar in Las Vegas four of them are gonna be okay you know it's they're, they're gonna laugh where you want them to laugh but they're not gonna have the same energy as the other crowds and that's just how it is sometimes you know yeah and crowds differ I and mean, that's 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 the weird thing like a guitar player doesn't have to wake up and go I hope my guitar is is awake yeah <laughs> I hope my guitar is well rested um but yeah that and that's what makes it fun and also like the Sometimes there are shows where you're just killing so hard that you you learn nothing. Yeah. No. Well, it, it's muscle memory then. If you're killing and never trying out stuff, it's just you're on like cruise control and you know. Oh no, I mean like the oh. crowd is just gonna laugh almost oh, at anything. Whatever. Yeah. And like some of those hard shows are the ones where you're like, okay, this will tell me which jokes actually work and which jokes are only getting by because I'm giving them energy and enthusiasm. Well, this is why I like performing in LA because the one thing in LA, everybody thinks they can do stand. Well, everybody thinks they can do anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's a different type of judgment. There aren't a lot of, how do I say this the right way? Everybody wants to be in an industry there. So everybody feels like they're in the industry. Like comedy and acting are the two things you could never do, but say you do. And people well, will like believe Seinfeld it. calls them pirate. Uh, yeah professions because if you want to be a pirate you just have to say i'm a pirate, pirate. And you're a pirate. <laughs> yeah there's no license there's no comedy license and you don't even have to be in anything to be an actor you just go to class or maybe not even go to class but and you that was youtube you can make your own stuff so you don't even need somebody anybody else in the world to say yes that's right so you just have to say look in the mirror and go i'm an actor and you're an actor and i have a series now <laughs> i have a deal with youtube they don't they, know it yet they, they don't know it and i put out my own thing but it's a thing where it's very la for me if you get a laugh, you'll crush anywhere else. Where when I go to New York, it's a lot different in New York where I feel like they're there to laugh first. They're there. Oh, I a, feel the opposite. Like oh, York, I think New York is so easy. Interesting. Well, it depends what rooms you're doing. All, oh, well, I was, I'm talking about the cellar right now. The cellar. And Gotham. People go into the cellar in particular. Like the reason it's such a great room, people, are, people know people are going there because they're comedy fans. Yes. So you're way ahead of the game already because they're going there because they love comedy. And they've been, and it's a big thing what you'll notice in Vegas, a lot of people are coming to a comedy show for the first time. So they don't know the etiquette sure. of comedy. Sure. Where I feel at the cellar, yeah. like people get it. But they also, because the cellar is booking the best comics, even if they don't know who you are, they know that because the seller is putting on a lineup, you're probably good. Yes. So there's all these things that are in your favor. And plus like Gnome and, and the, 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 just what they do to make the like architecture of the room work for comedy. And if something is off, they'll fix it. Yeah. And they're so responsive. Like they're making sure that you have all the tools you possibly could have to kill. But like when I was coming up pre-seller or even when I was working at the seller, but doing running, still running around, like, um, those bar shows in New York, those Brooklyn rooms, those rooftops. Oh yeah. Those are, those are 
full contact. Those are those ones you are right, eat, eat, eat or be eaten. What, what, what is your worst experience? Have worst you, experience doing yeah, comedy? Ever, ever. I think the weirdest one was it was Super Bowl Sunday. So that was the first well, that, mistake. Yeah, already, I was yeah, a baby yeah. comic and I was like, I'm going to get booked every night, even if it's Super Bowl Sunday. And I was like, if there, if people want to show up, I'll do it. So it was a youth hostel on Super Bowl Sunday. I dragged myself way uptown, way, way uptown to this, this youth hostel. Uh, it takes forever to get there. I get into the room and there's only two audience members. And we realize as soon as the show starts that they do not speak English at all. So we are performing for a crowd of two that does not speak the language we're performing in. And it's me, Mike Lawrence was there. Uh, who else was there? Uh, Jared was there. Uh, Jared Logan. It, it, it was pretty, it, was, it ended up being like, if you look at the lineup now, it's like a murderer's row. Yes, yeah. Uh, and I just remember like, we just started doing weird bits with each other. Like I think Jared and Mike, we're like, what country are you from? And they were like, Estonia or some country. And they're like, well, we know the, the national anthem. And they made up the Estonian national anthem. And then there was an arcade machine with Street Fighter. So I think Mike <laughs> and I took, we were like, we basically narrated a game of Street Fighter like it was a wrestling match. And so that was, it was a very like Andy Kaufman-esque. Yes. So we were just coming up. We just tried to do the best with it. And we put on an hour and 20 minute show for Wait, two people so that don't understand English. Wait, so who this? The it was a guy named Randy. Was Randy there? Randy was there. Oh yeah. So oh, there yeah. was three people there. Yeah, Randy. Randy <laughs> would bring this like Fisher Price karaoke, like no. microphone and thing, and that's what we performed with. No, you're lying. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. How much did you get paid that show? Zero dollars. I lost money because I spent money to go to and from on the subway. <laughs> I paid for that experience. As so, you would say that's the weirdest experience. Have you had the worst experience? Where you got off the stage and go, yo, man, I need to quit. Or, or, or like, I just, mean, I've been like attacked on stage. So that's really? probably not. Tell me about that. A high. <laughs> well, tell me about that. Like attacked, like physically? Yeah, a couple times. Um, and what? I don't know what it is about. What, what about is me? it about you? What about me, little me? What, what, t please, how'd you get attacked the, the, on stage? The two main shows that stand how many, out. Hold on, before you, how many times have you been attacked Define on stage? Define attacked. <laughs> uh, physically, like, assaulted on stage once. Okay. Um, like, Will Smith once. Um, then, like, having, having things thrown at me a couple of times. A couple, okay, yeah. let's talk about the assault. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was uh, at a comedy club in Rhode Island that I love. Um, it was at the Rhode Island Comedy Connection. Uh, Corey's like, oh, you've been there. Oh yeah, I love it. Corey's like, they're, they're the amazing. Best, the best. They're amazing. Um, so I get, I, I think I, what had happened was the feature had been going after this guy and he was getting drunker and drunker. I didn't know that because I was in, for those who have not been to the club, it was a bank. So the green room is a vault. So it is pretty soundproof because you're literally in the secure vault of the bank. Uh, so I get on stage not really knowing that. And uh, the lady goes up to go to the bathroom, the lady that this drunk guy is with. And as soon as she gets up, I say some kind of line like, uh, I'm going to time you if it's more than two minutes of just shit on delay. Uh -huh. And I think he sees us, oh, no, no, another comedian's coming after us. This isn't going to happen. And in his drunk math, he decided to just come on stage and push me against the wall. And then Corey, who was there, uh, Corey's not the biggest guy, but um, I think he realized he's like, I mean, he just came on and grabbed the guy who was much bigger than him and got him off stage. Uh, the way like a mother, I think, protects a child. <laughs> like that kind of like adrenaline yeah, rush. Yeah. There's size wise, Corey, that guy had a lot of height and, and muscle on Corey. Uh, he was a big, scary so, dude. So they just put, and he sits back down and is fine? Or? No, no, they threw him out of the club. Uh -huh. But the lady still in the bathroom and doesn't know her boyfriend <laughs> just attacked the comic and got thrown out. And my first response when he gets thrown out is I'm like, because they usually film most of the shows. And I was like, did you film that? Because that's going on YouTube. Yeah. And he's like, no, 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 the camera wasn't recording. I'm like, bring him back. <laughs> Let's do it from the top. I need the run content. It, run it back. How long ago was this? This was, I, I think it must have been... 2011. So this is a long time. So ago. when the lady came back, well, did you make a joke about that or did she immediately? Yeah. Go? And then she was distressed. Cause she's like, where is my, where is my boyfriend? And I think she stayed for the whole set, which I took <laughs> as a huge victory. Yeah. And she hated him. Oh yeah. And I had like 20 minutes, at least tw I was only maybe, yeah, I think I was about 20 minutes in and was, I had to do at least 45. So I had another 25 minimum to do. Now, one thing I love about your comment, you're so good at crowd work. Is that something you've always been good at or you kind of developed that? 
Oh no, I learned that over time. Really? So you can't see, yeah. because I want to be good at crowd work, but I'm so scared of putting myself out there for crowd work because I feel like I wouldn't know what to say when they come back. You know, you that's just, just my week. You yeah? just do it. I mean, one of the best pieces of advice I got, I was working at Times Square Art Center or T-SAC. Yeah. Which I was like, that sounds like a terrible disease. <laughs> like somebody comes to the room oh, and like, I'm some so T-Sac? sorry you have T-SAC. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> Um, but it was the old Laugh Factory, but they lost the license to Laugh Factory. So it's still like the color scheme yeah. of the Laugh Factory, but it just said Times Square Art Center. It should have just said comedy at some point because it was it was just a comedy club. Yeah. Uh, former strip venue, though. So one of the rooms was the Donkey Room. Like, what happened there? The Donkey Room. Why is it room. called the Donkey Room? <laughs> uh, so I would that, that was uh, one of the, basically the first paying, like regular paying gigs. They would hand me a check. I was like, oh, my God, I'm getting paid to do comedy. This is great. Um, I was living on Dollar Pizza. Yeah. Uh, but uh, why did I bring up TSAC? Oh, because um, crowd work. Crowd work. Yeah. Uh, I I was talking to a comic that was uh, had been in the game a little longer, and I was asking him about advice for crowd work. And he was the qu- number number one piece of advice was keep asking them questions. It's like the more information you have, the more ammunition you have. He's like, and also the more you talk to them, uh, eventually they're gonna stumble, and that's when you pounce. So th- keep, so you keep them on questions. That was part of the tactic, and then. The other thing what w- with that crowd work is he's like, you have the microphone, you have all the power, you're louder than them, the audience is on your side. So you have all the power and this is your job. So the idea that this guy is gonna walk in and take it from you, it's not gonna happen. So you need to walk out with the confidence of knowing like you're a major league baseball player and this guy's little league at best. Got you. So like, and th- that also is a way too of, sometimes you can beat up a heckler too much. Like you have to, you can't immediately go aggressive. You have to scale it up. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's part of it is like, if, if a little leaguer comes up to play that you just immediately smash <laughs> them, you're like, why is <laughs> he's so mean? Yeah. Why is he doing that? <laughs> um, so that, that th- those, having those things in mind really help. Mm. Like you've been doing, this is your job. Yes. You well, know, no, I doing. love comedy. Like I'm love just going out. I kind of mess with the audience a little bit, but I admire people like you, like what, especially when I saw you at Mad Apple, you know, I admire when a person can come out, uh, do a couple jokes, but then just crowd work it like yeah. and what that does to be honest with you when you when what i love about joe coy joe coy can do an hour of crowd work and then do an hour set like i don't ever want to do two hours but on my scale it's like if i could do 20 minutes of crowd work i don't have to lose material right I, it, every night it could be a really different show you know and that's what's so great about that's it. why i do it i i mean i opened for Susie essman mm-hmm. um and she said something that really felt that was just it was really important to hear, and it was great advice, which was, if they're going to come to see you live, give them a reason to see you live. If you're yeah. just going to do the same set over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Then when they see, if they see you twice or three times, and it's the exact same set. Yeah. It, it, it sort of, they sort of go, oh, okay, I get it. But like, if every time they come, it gives just, you have to give them a reason for why they need to see you and live. And that crowd work is, you know, because- Every like, show's a one night every, only. It is, because it's different. You may do a couple of the same jokes, or like, hopefully you're writing new stuff, because anytime, I will never go to a market more than twice without like having a bunch of new of jokes. Of course. You of know course. what I mean? But you adding the crowd work, if a person came to saw see you on Friday and then saw you on Saturday, they would think they saw two different shows because the crowd works so different. So right. you really, but they would hear one or two jokes that are the same. They'd be like, oh, that's great, whatever. Yeah. You know, and that's why I want to, because like when watching Joe Coy, I, I, I toured Joe Coy for three years. I never saw the same show once. Yeah, And that's what's so amazing about Joe Coy and why he's selling out stadiums. Like it, it's just, and you're so good at it too. So I admire that man. So oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it was. It was, it was it's too- just about asking, just layering the questions and waiting for them to stumble on something. And having that, this is going to date me, but like I think of it like a roll. If there's a Rolodex, where yeah. you're trying to, you know, figuring out what are the games. Like it's also like improv in that sense. What are the games that you can play? Um, and then as soon as you find that game, just go, you know, go and then it's it. muscle memory too, because you know, it's kind of like David Letterman. They were like, Oh, this just happened, but there was a camera perfectly placed. So you knew it was going right, to happen. Exactly. You know what I mean? So you, yeah, you also have to ju- create situations yes, that you yes. have, that you can then create humor from yeah. you're, you're, cre- you're finding the game as opposed to like letting the game come to you sometimes. Now, Matt Apple, you got in this show, uh, because you toured with the illusionist, correct? Yeah, so the the Mad Apple was produced by the Works, which was acquired by Cirque. So uh, they they knew of me from the Illusionists and the Unbelievables. So I'd done a bunch of things with them, um, and so I, yeah, I got a call. I was doing spots at the cellar. I was doing like I had like four or five shows that night, different places, um, 
And, but I think I was outside of like the village underground when I got the call. I, I remember Sweet. exactly where I was standing. Um, and they said, Hey, can you come in tomorrow? We need, we need you to fill in. We need to fill in for tomorrow. So we're going to put you on a 7 a.m. flight. You're in the show by 8 p.m. Wow. Uh, and I was like, all right, I'll pack my bag. Uh, I can do this. So I did the show on Sunday. I had three pair of underwear. Uh, they were like, Monday's an off day, but Tuesday, do, do, we want you to do Tuesday also. And I was like, great, three pair of underwear. I still have, okay, great, great, great. You're good. I do Tuesday. They go, you know what? We have shows through Saturday. Can you just like stay through Saturday? And, and now I you like, I got to get more underwear. I was like, yeah, I'm going to have to rewear some underwear. <laughs> you know, we have stores in Vegas, right? I know, They're- but I'm also Jewish. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that feels like an expense. Uh, and also why they hired me. Come yeah, on, it's a New York show. There they you need, go. There I'm you a go. human bagel. But uh, <laughs> so I, I, before that Saturday show, um, they had sent me a contract to stay for a year. So basically they kidnapped me. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best kidnapping ever though. It's amazing. Now, I know you- I also had to call my fiance who at that time was in Nebraska because she was visiting her family and be like, hey, so I'm in Las Vegas and I think I need to stay here. Now, was she excited about that or no? I think she was excited. I think you yeah. shouldn't know if she was excited. No, I mean, we, we've been living in a She's 500 in square foot studio apartment with a dog um, for a while. And so the opportunity to be, have some kind of space, okay. I think was very appealing. Now I'm sure the heat is killing her right now. It's a dry heat. So see, it's not bad to me. <laughs> it's not bad to me. I didn't, I'm from Texas where humidity uh, is the worst. It's like New York has bad. New York is humidity. so humid. And so, you have to be in a subway waiting, for, you know, next to a million other people. Oh. So that that 90 degrees is a, might as well be yeah. 200. Here, it's not bad. To me, it's not bad. Everybody wants to tell you it's a dry heat. And you're like, I don't know if it makes it bad. It's, if it's 120, the fact that it's dry is not helping. So, I mean... But just think it's if like you saying, had oh, humidity. you cheated on my wife. And you're like, I cheated on my wife. You're like, oh my God, that's terrible. No, I was with a dry lady. She was very dry. Like, I don't know if that makes it much better. <laughs> no, I think it's totally different. Because I was in, uh, where was I? Uh, Florida. I mean, first of all, I was in Florida. Florida so that makes is, it bad. Oh my God. It's a swamp. But it's a swamp. So it felt like you were walking through something. Like, it, like it was thick. Like, it was like, ugh. Yeah. Here, I get back, it's hot. But I'm like, yo, I don't you have You don't that sweat. Fit. No. And that's yeah. what I'm all about. Not sweating. Yeah. I can't sweat anymore. I hate sweating. Yeah. I'm so lazy. And also now I'm driving. Yeah. Which is a huge life change. Oh, yeah. I, I totally forgot. I don't, I've never had a car before. <laughs> I've lived in New York for 14 years. I co- well, college for four years. Uh, Boston, we didn't have, we didn't drive. Yeah. You, it's a walking campus. You would take the T, you know. Uh, and so then you move, I moved straight to New York City. Also no car. So that's. 18 years, years of no driving. Of no driving. And wow. I had a license. I always maintain my license because every once in a while yeah. I'd rent a car and do a one nighter. It made more sense to take, you know, a car. Uh-huh. But once Uber entered the game too, it was really like game over Isn't forever. Isn't that weird we're just drive. letting random people drive us around? Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. really, if you think about it, like I, I still think about every time somebody picks me up, I'm going, this is just some random dude that might have not been doing this yesterday. Yeah. Well, the right? Las Vegas drivers are far more chatty than the New York drivers. I don't want chat. I <laughs> I don't want you talking to me. You know, I like like I I don't know. I'm not that. Dude. And the one in, ones in L.A. have screenplays. Screenplays. I feel like every time I got into an oh, Uber in L.A., they're all yeah, like, "I'm store. also like, oh, you're a comedian. I also do comedy. I've written this spec. Do you want to check it out?" Yeah, man. It, and that's why I don't want to hear the talk. I always put <laughs> I always put the uh, the you know they have a button you can press where it goes uh, no talking. And I press that. Button. I'd like to imagine in my head the version. But I don't want to be a dick about it. I don't it. know the button. I think what you do is you just go like this. <laughs> I just picture you like Shh. leaning forward and putting your finger over the like that's the button, right? <laughs> there is a button <laughs> where you can turn it on. No, but I, I just don't want to. Oh, I'm not. I'm not a. Here's what's interesting. Here's my button. What is w- one time I got into an Uber after a gig. And they go, where are you coming from? And I go, oh, I just did a comedy gig. I was like, oh no, he's going to ask me about yeah. comedy. And he goes, oh, you're a comedian. Tell me a joke. And so my favorite joke to do in this circumstance is like, I'll, I'll, I'll pose it to you. Uh, how do you make a plumber cry? I don't know. Murder his family. <laughs> and then that guy just didn't speak to me for 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> it's a great joke to end a conversation. Murder his family. <laughs> Murder his family. <laughs> yeah, that would work. It would make him cry. Yeah, it, it would. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and and he doesn't know he has a possible psycho in the backseat too. That's so right. that's exactly. that's great. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's Vegas. Yeah, I had to find. You know what I did find though, and this is my thing. 
to if because I go to the airport a lot. I found an Uber driver, and he was so amazing. He's just your guy. He's just my guy. I no, Perfect. I got his number, and now that's all. Yeah. So it's kind of like you got to once you find that one, don't let him go. <laughs> right? It's like a marriage. Don't let him go because I don't want to get in random people's cars anymore. I know this dude is reliable because you know we take early morning like i'm oh, leaving yeah. for the airport at 4 a.m of course so i need a reliable dude that's gonna be there and he's that guy man he's phenomenal it's like <laughs> love he he has my coffee ready for me oh he my no god oh it's great it's great like that's I, beautiful like i found the best driver ever and it's an <laughs> uber person you know yeah. what i mean so it's great it's great so that any advice my thing is find your person I and be that. loyal to them and they'll be loyal That's to the you. difference I think between like we're we're that age. New York you can't young do comics that. are like who's your, used to be like who's your weed guy and yeah. we're like we have a guy that gets us coffee and that's all we need. That's all we need. He picks us up at 4 a.m. and he on, says nice things. Just be on time. Yeah. That's all I want. Like that's all I want in my life to be on time and yeah. to go to bed at like 9:30 if possible. I perform oh, like I'm both. still an insomniac. I'm a vampire. Oh no. No. Like, oh yeah. Man, I had it so great during the pandemic. <laughs> I was going to bed at like eight o'clock. Holy moly. And that's so eight, eight thirty tops. And I <laughs> You're remember like Wheel of Fortune and I'm out. Right? I, I'm serious. I love sleeping and waking up at like four AM. That's my thing. That's my, oh my clock. God. Four or five AM. I can't do that anymore because I'm at the cellar until like eleven thirty. But uh I remember my wife brought it up the other day. The first time I met her well, not the first time I met the first time I spent Thanksgiving with her parents. I go, oh, I'm going to go lay down. And it was like 8 o'clock. <laughs> they were like, oh, he's going to take a nap and come back out. And then I never came back out. <laughs> like, what did we say? <laughs> and they go like, upstairs and they're just broken glass <laughs> and the, in the outline of you. Just be like, through the and then a loose parachute on the lawn and then a, the skin marks, tire marks. So she says our family was like, like did he just <laughs> go to sleep at 8 o'clock? That's you know, amazing. Life is like, yeah, he does that, you know. So I, I, I set the mark at the beginning. Like that's the thing. You're, you're engaged. Yeah, I'm engaged. Set oh, the, yeah. set the one thing because you only get one. Set the <laughs> one thing that at the beginning before you get married. This is what I'm gonna do on this day. Like my thing. My wife knows. No matter what, I don't care if it's a kid function. I don't care what it is. Miami Hurricanes, if they play football. <laughs> I told her this at the beginning. Like, <laughs> I am so loyal to the Miami Hurricanes football team. If they lose, this day, I hurt. I physically <laughs> have pain, Harrison. If they, like, I've never felt that way about any team, any team in my life. But with the Miami Hurricanes, if they win, it's the best day. If they <laughs> lose, I hurt. That's, it's emotional gambling. You're gambling your emotions. I, but I, I, it's crazy how I'll be sad. I'll, like I'm thinking about them losing now and I'm getting sad. But I told my wife at the beginning, I said, no, no matter what, whatever time they play, all I'm asking you in this marriage is for that three hours. And here's, this will tell you where my state of mind is, is you said the Miami Hurricanes. I'm like, is that the name of the football team? <laughs> Because you don't know. It's a college yeah. football they team. They named their college football team after the thing that destroys all of their shit. <laughs> Yes, because a football team destroys everything. But that's like the trap. Like all of them probably like lost a something, a piece of whether it was a person or property. Okay, you to a hurricane. See, it would be like if the if the the Brandeis team was called the Brandeis Holocaust. Like, <laughs> sure, I get that they're like we're gonna murder the other team and <laughs> squish them out of existence. But like we would never name. We wouldn't have the Brandeis look, Harrison, camps. Look, see, and this is why you can't have conversations with comedians. <laughs> Cause they always got to make it funny. Look, but I'm trying like to help. my high school team was the Lawrence tornadoes. And truly my Nebraska fiance was like, you wouldn't name a team after something so horrible. <laughs> Cause they have real tornadoes. Yeah. But Miami is so hard Harrison that they will <laughs> name a team. The, the Miami pit bulls. Those rap. are illegal. Those are illegal in Miami. That's how pit bulls. Yeah. Mm. The only legal one is the singer. He's the only one allowed. <laughs> See, see, that's why I can't listen. I'm trying to <laughs> see what happened. I'm trying to give this man advice. I'm trying to let him know. I'm trying to let you know. You got <laughs> to, before you get married, tell her the one thing that you I have to. Pick the thing. You do. You do. I'm telling you, then they can never go back. Like my wife, I do everything now. <laughs> I do everything. And I love being married, but I know like I should have put more. I should have been like, oh, I need. Well, no, I, that's all I really need is my Miami Hurricanes. Everything else is good. 
Like, like I, I had a podcast, two podcasts today. She was yeah. like, okay, I'll take the kids. See, yeah. it, it works. Like Beautiful. she knows when I have podcasts, she, but, and I do a lot of things for her, but no matter what, no matter what, you got to have that one Miami Hurricanes football. The, I like the, it. The, the, and, and she can't, she doesn't even try to argue. She could be <laughs> like, oh, but, but no, no, I win. Cause I said it before the first, probably the second date. I was like, look, no matter what happens with it, Miami Hurricanes football. That's, That's how good. loyal I am. That's yeah. pretty good. Do you have anything you're loyal to like that? Besides comedy? Well, the thing is, the things that I'm into are the things that she's into. So, like, from at the very beginning. Escape rooms? Yes. See, now we got to talk. <laughs> Harrison is Love all of them. And she loves them. That was I, That's how you know. So, is she kind of like a nerd, too, then? Yeah. Okay, so two nerds met. I mean, two. I mean, in a oh, good, yeah. I mean, I mean that's great. Y'all like the same things. We moved into the house this new house and uh she we were unpacking and she goes i only brought one dvd and it was like the complete blu-ray collection of star wars and i was like this is fantastic really find so a girl you knew, who loves star wars so you knew it was love it love then i think for sure oh yeah i think my like do y'all do to dress up cosplay and stuff like that too we don't know no we don't really do cosplay okay, although right. she really likes halloween she likes to really dress up oh really she loves do, you, that. do you do it too I was not a Halloween family, so I, I'm trying to be more of a Halloween person for mm -hmm. her. And it's fun. What'd you dress up last year? We well, because it was the pandemic, we had sort of pandemic Halloweens. We we just did one onesies. So I had like okay. a I think I was a penguin. A penguin? Okay. Yeah. Okay, and what was she? She was the dragon from How to Train Your Dragon. Oh wow. That sounds yeah. a lot. But it was a onesie. It was a onesie. Okay, so it wasn't. Yeah, a it just had little wings and a tail. It was very oh. comfortable. Oh <laughs> honestly. It's funny, at Mad Apple, um, Two of our acrobats wear these little onesies over their outfits when they're warming up. And I think it's great. I was like, one day I want that to be in the show. Now, do those... have a reindeer and a fox swinging around. <laughs> now, do those guys, uh, do they party hard? Like, do y'all go out to have, like, do y'all have, like, I don't know, Cirque du Soleil functions or things we, like that? We party, although I think the funny thing is, like, imagine if one of those guys becomes hungover, what that show is oh to them. Oh my goodness. You can't go on the wheel of death and be hungover. <laughs> like after our opening night, there was definitely some hungover people. And so that my, I think that was my favorite joke I made. I was like, last night was their opening night. So at any moment, any of these acrobats could vomit. <laughs> you guys have come to the most exciting show on the strip. <laughs> So I think I think they know that like they're it's a very physical show for them. It especially. is so man. they can't go, they can't go too hard. Otherwise, it would have serious ramifications. It's, I it, think you know like we're around some of the biggest comedians in the world, and people go, "Oh my god, it must be crazy to be that close to them." Like you're around some of the most physically gifted people in the world. Yeah, I feel fat constantly. These people are perfect specimens. There's this one dude at the end of the show that takes off his Whips shirt. Whips off his shirt. And, and he did that. And my wife was looking. I go, sad. He looks just like me. And my wife looks at me <laughs> and doesn't say a thing. And I go, oh, you can't even lie to me anymore. <laughs> it's like he looks that like so chiseled. I go, yeah. looks just like me. Yeah, and sure. he brought in donuts for his birthday. And I'm like, are you trying to get us fatter than you so you look even better? Is this a trick? D that's got to be genetics. <laughs> There's nothing he's doing to look like that. I mean, he works his ass off. Oh, of course, all of them do. They but I all, guess, yeah, I guess all they do that like six hours of training a day and the show. Oh wow, that is, they that's like Olympic level it. stuff. It's unbelievable. Wow, yeah. and all you do is show up. And I just gotta walk up and to do jokes. That's it's great. great, but you're good at it. It's you super fun. It. It's you mental. It. It's mental gymnastics. Like I, I, I want to learn your ways of crowd work. Like if I can get that down, and I loved how you did it at the show. Anybody. Go see Mad Apple because it's so good. And Harrison destroys it. And uh, Brad is great. Chris is great. But man, I love the crowd work you did. Oh, thank you. It's awesome. And then the magic trick you throw in, I'm not going to give it away. But man, <laughs> that is so good. My wife, me and my wife are talking about it all the way home. Yeah. We're going, how did he do that? Nice. Yeah. And I told my wife, you, well, forget it. I told her you told me a couple of other jokes. Like you, I mean, you showed me a couple of tricks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I haven't mastered those yet, but when I break them out, it's going to yeah, be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So what's next? I mean, what do you want? Oh, let's talk about the cellar real quick because you've been there, I'm sure, and seen. What's the craziest thing you've seen at the cellar and what's your most memorable night? Yeah. Uh, well, the, one, of the, one of the most memorable nights was just getting past there. Um, Did you have to... Oh, so like everybody, everybody has to audition to get into okay, the cellar. And when you get into the club, it's called pass for the people that don't yes. know comedy. Okay. Yes. So go ahead. Uh, and, and they don't just say, Oh, you passed. Essie sits you down and gives you her information and goes, this is how you send it avails. And you go, I think I passed. I think because if she doesn't give you that information, you've not passed. Wow. Um, Cause she calls all the comedian after they perform. She says, come upstairs and meet. Yeah. Her. 
But yeah. my my ver- my way of getting in was really interesting because normally you need like a recommendation or two from people who have been at the club forever. And I wasn't getting that. And I was like, I think I'm ready though. So I emailed Gnome, the owner directly because he had the podcast. And yep. I said, hey, you've talked about every aspect of the seller, but you've never really talked about how you audition again in the club. If you want to do an audition live on air, I'll do it. And I didn't think through the ramifications of that because he's like, yeah, absolutely. And I was like, oh shit, if the- I don't pass, they're still going to air it. So I... Like this is this is a really like do or die moment. So they, I had a conversation in, on the podcast with comedians. Then they brought their equipment downstairs, feel, like taped me doing my set with an audience stuff. With an audience, okay. that was my audition. I came back up, uh, and I found out this later that no one was like, "Who is this comic and why is he emailing me?" They thought I was going to eat it, and then they'd be able to rip me apart on the podcast. They thought that would be hilarious, and I ended up crushing it. Nice. So they were like, "Oh shit, I think he." I think he passed. And then at the end of the podcast, I'm like, so I'm in? And he's like, no, no, now you have to audition for Esty. <laughs> so Gnome was essentially my recommender. Through uh, the pod- Gnome in the podcast was my recommendation to Esty. Then I auditioned a week later and that was then I got passed. So, so describe that. It's- but you would actually, I'm the only comic who you could literally listen. They replay my audition. Like the, the jokes in that get... I get paid, like it gets replayed on Sirius XM as part of the podcast. Oh, that's you great. You actually listen to the set that got me past at the seller. So when, did you do the same set for Esty? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. and did it crush again? Yeah. Nice. Because that to me, that room is so, I mean, it's so much energy in those rooms yeah. over there. I you mean, go up on like the Midnight Friday show. So it's one of those rooms you went up like, that late? Yeah, it's one of those shows that you should kill. Like yeah, that, because the crowd is set, primed. Yeah. Yeah, they pri- and then I'm sure they said, "Hey, this guy is new," and they, they kind of hype you up if it's a good host because they want you to do well too. Yeah, and when and I, I knew most of the guys there, uh, guys. Okay. And, when I say guys, I mean guys and girls. But um, so like the host knew, like I knew the host, so he was like, "I got gotcha. you." You know, the best feeling is when you see comics when you're on stage come in and like check yeah. you, and it's like legendary people, and that's so great. And it's not a competitive thing; they're just like, "Oh, who's this guy?" You know, yeah. and that's so great and. To have some of the best comics in the world go, yo, man, nice set. And it's yeah. right there. You know, it's like, oh, uh, it makes it. What's interesting knowing uh, uh, people that blow up is it's so real because you see it and you know them. And I'm kind of yeah. like, oh, you're just one. You're just that one thing away. Right. You know, if you're funny, because there's a lot of funny comics that never get discovered. You know, it's like American. I tell people it's like American Idol. Kelly Clarkson always could sing. Right. She just needed that yeah. platform. And there's so many funny comedians around the world. They just need that one thing, whether it's a Netflix special, whether they get booked on a sitcom, whether they do a video that blows up on whatever outlet. If Because then once you start getting booked, you got to prove it. You can't right. not be not funny when people go see you because they'll never come back. But yeah, you're building up that sort of yeah. higher so that when the spark hits, it goes. It up. just just it just yeah. blows up. So was there? Is that your best night at the cellar? Is there a night where you just saw like because you hear these legendary nights, Dave Chappelle, Chris Tucker, all yeah. these people in one place? Have you ever been there for one of those nights? Yeah, I mean, also like getting compliments from your heroes. Like yeah. I remember hearing from comics that I admired, being like, "You're really funny," or like, "I love your writing," and you're like. These are the people, these are the reasons I I do Do you remember the first big person to tell you that, that you kind of blew you away? Attell said I was a great writer. And I was like, you're the greatest writer. Yeah. (laughs) Like, maybe ever. Like, so just hearing somebody like that, who like, just straight up a hero of mine, being like, you're funny? Like, holy shit. Like, that's insane. Um, And like, I remember I was sitting at the table, it was just me one night. Because like, other sometimes there's that weird thing where like, there's shows are switching over. Okay, so people, people are sitting explain, at different tables. Explain, play, play, explain the table you're talking about, so people know. Yeah, so. so the table is really important. It's the thing that you sort of also kind of dream about in New York, which is if you're a past comic at the cellar, you have access to sit at this, the table, which is the table in the back of the olive tree, the Mediterranean, Middle Eastern restaurant above the comedy So hall. let me ask you this. Are all past comics able to sit there? Mm-hmm. All of them. Anybody's past the center can okay, sit at that great, table. Great. Yeah. Okay. And it doesn't matter your level. And that's what's sort of beautiful yeah. about it is it's you get I get to sit there, but Chappelle also will sit there. Mm-hmm. And there are times where literally I look around the table, I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like it's Aziz, Chappelle, Kevin Hart. I'm sitting at the table and we're all just talking about comedy because it's the thing that we all love. But no, just seeing like the obsession that they all have, like seeing somebody like a Chris Rock. Because when you most people see Chris Rock, like when I was young and 14 it's or 15, polished. it's polished and perfect. And you're like, you can't, nobody can do that. Uh-huh. That's superhuman. But then you see, I've seen Chris in the cellar with like cardboard boxes that he's ripped, like he's ripped the lids off the boxes and he's taken a Sharpie and written his ideas on it. I'm like, you can afford a pad, Chris. <laughs> but like, that's when the inspiration struck and he st- put that on the piano. 
And he's work. He was working through this stuff and being like, "Oh, this is the process for everybody." I tell you, the it is, it is, and you realize that everybody is on equal ground when you start a bit. Yeah, and it's who can excel it. Like I, I went to a Dave Chappelle show. I went to a special actually, the the one he shot at the Belly Room, of the Comedy Store. And what's interesting about that is when um, he he shot the specials for about 45 minutes and then he workshop stuff for the next two hours, right? It's one of those where I got it, let's just mess around, right? Yeah. But to see him throw out all these concepts that didn't work, it made me feel great. Like, oh, because you, you need to see great stumble. And of course, it's a day, it, Dave Chappelle's stumble is not a stumble, but you know it's not hitting like it will be when he puts it out. But to see that and go, oh, okay, they have to workshop stuff too. Right. Because even we're in comedy and we know they have to workshop stuff, but it's different actually having to see them workshop. Because yeah. then you're like, ah, that didn't work. I, and so they say a lot of stuff that doesn't work too, but until you see it, it's yeah. different. And it feels sometimes like if you, all you see is the specials, you feel like they woke up one day and they walked out <laughs> yeah, and did that exactly. special. Exactly. And so you don't realize there's this long, long process Absolutely. to get to that each each and every special. And so watching all the comics work through it, and, and there are different ways of working through it. The way Dave works through it is so different than the way, uh, well, Dave Chappelle versus David Tell working through it differently, uh -huh. or, or even... Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle have so different, such different processes and watching each one and being like, okay, this is, I think this is the process that I'd like, like to try. No, well, I would love to know the difference of yeah. those two processes. Cause what, what I do know about Dave Chappelle, what I saw, and maybe it's different in New York. He's the dude that will just kind of talk. Yeah. And I think he is the most idiosyncratic process. Yes. He, he'll sit up for four and a half hours smoking a cigarette, just talking and trying to find even the premise and find yeah. what, what are those areas that he needs to really dig into? Chris comes up with a little bit more of a plan of yeah. like, these are the jokes that I've been working on and I wanna see if they work and throw them out. So Circus Soleil, Mad Apple, you're on that. Uh, are you saying Circus Soleil or Cirque du Soleil? Circus Soleil. Oh, oh Cirque du Soleil, Cir it's French. Oh, Cirque Circus Dis of the Sun. Circus of the Sun, yeah. I can say that better. <laughs> so you know, anything else you got coming up? Um, I got that uh, for do, the next year. Yeah. So we're you doing, really can't go anywhere and tour anymore. So we have dark days. So like uh, that sounds yeah. weird. Like we have some very dark <laughs> days. We have dark days. Um, we have we have like two weeks off at a time. Different part, and I'll be touring during those, those okay periods. Um, but uh, and we have so yeah. But five days a week, Friday through Tuesday, two shows a night, seven and at nine thirty at New York, New York. MadAppleLV.com. There you go. The tickets. And then you're at the cellar. Sometimes you pop in on the yeah, days off. I, I, on my days off, I like to pop in at all the different clubs around town and, and work on new stuff. It's been fun. Like every, now every, when I pop in at the different clubs on the off days, uh, there's at least like almost every show, get, there's one or two people that I saw. Oh, I saw my Mad Apple. Like you hear That's them whisper cool. it. That's he was cool. in the suit. Like they know the burgundy suit. They're the like, burgundy suit. The ketchup suit. <laughs> the, the suit that you brought from New York. That I brought from New York that, I, that was tailored for a five, the, my body five years ago. Oh boy. Yeah. They haven't given you money for a new suit? They're working on it. No, no, they're working on it. it I, this is Cirque. It's supposed to have money, yeah. Harrison. I do my own makeup. That's like a Cirque thing. That's really cool. Is there's so many people in every cast. Like there's 60 or 70, somebody's yeah. more in a cast. So they can't, everyone has to do their own makeup. Otherwise it would be chaos. Yeah, 100%. So they, they teach you, they bring in like professional people and they give you like a one-on-one -on -one tutorial on how to apply your makeup for the show. So that's actually been, it's been a very nice routine. It's like, I really, it's very zen. Are you wearing makeup now? I'm not wearing makeup. Okay, okay. You look beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and, oh, and uh, when do you get married, can you say? Is that coming up? Are you excited? Where are you at on this? We are we are very excited. Um, we I think we're getting married in February. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So everybody can come out because that's right. Now the pandemic is it'll be pretty much yeah. Hopefully. And that was the whole delay was yeah. we were we got engaged January twenty twenty one like peak pandemic. Oh my goodness! I was like, well, if you haven't murdered each other while living in five hundred square feet, it's it's meant to be. Uh -huh, exactly. This is the hardest our relationship will ever be. Is in this is in a pandemic in a tiny apartment. Do you realize people that couples that stay through a pandemic, you probably have seen, that's probably like 10 years of a relationship. hundred percent. You know, because I remember my dad would go to work at nine, come back at six right. every single day. So literally 
in two years would have been like a month during the pandemic. There was know? a lot of pandemic divorces because they're like, oh, this is who my person is. <laughs> Absolutely. Because you had to deal with them all the time. All you know? the time. And that's when I've, well, I always knew my wife was great, but I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah. Because I'm I, like, I, I talk about it in my show, but I love predictability. I love coming home knowing what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, I don't, I'm not the thing where, oh, I wonder what's going to happen when I get home. I dated a girl like that. You know, like <laughs> literally every time I go, yeah. you can be like, Ooh, what's, what's wrong with you? So, uh, yeah, but congrats on everything, man. I'm so happy for you. Thank you. No, yeah. I'm, it's it's been a crazy amount of change in a very short amount of time. But so far, it's been really, really fun. All right. So where can people follow you? People can follow me at Harrison Comedy on uh, TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitter. HarrisonGreenbaum.com is my uh, website. It has all my tour information. And MadAppleLV.com is uh, tickets for the Cirque du Soleil show that I'm in. All right. Yeah. All right. Do that. And also, everybody, check out and subscribe to this page right now. You already checked Do it right out. Now. So subscribe. We need your subscription so I can get an engineer that knows how to plug in plugs, right, Alex? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's you right. You have to do this all again from the top, right? Right. Oh, yeah. he's like, <laughs> I'm about to shoot again. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Harrison. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much, man. All right.